Welcome to the Venture Capital Podcast. I'm here with Peter Harris with the University Growth Fund. And today we are going to talk about how to find a venture capitalist for your startup. I know this is something that we've been talking about because we own appointment.com. And I'm like, in 2022, I'm not sure if the methods that worked five years ago are the same things that happen today. So on this podcast, let's kind of go through it. So the first question is, is Peter, like, what is your general advice for someone raising in 2022? Yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, I think it, at the start out, there's a whole bunch of tools that exist today that didn't exist before. For example, one of my favorites is Signal.NFX, and it's this great database of VCs and the kind of stuff they invest in. If you know somebody that has an account to PitchBook, that's another good place. And basically, like the way I would approach it is I would start looking through the different types of VCs have invested in companies similar to mine and target those funds. Um, And ideally, you want to look not just for the fund itself, but for the actual partner within the fund that's doing those deals. Does Signal provide that? Uh, They do, actually. Yeah. And it's great. It's a free tool. So highly recommend it. Uh, PitchBook also has similar data, but, you know, that's a paid subscription. So you got to either pay for it or or get some help on that one. Crunchbase or AngelList wouldn't have that kind of data. Uh, No, they both they both do. But, uh, you know, Crunchbase doesn't it can be a little bit hit or miss sometimes. Because Angelus um, would just say, if I'm with this fund, this fund has invested in these deals. But you're saying that you're trying to find, let's just say we're, we're targeting True Ventures. Yeah. True Ventures has worked a lot with scheduling apps. Mm-hmm. And there's also a particular VC there. Crunchbase would never cover that. Angelus wouldn't cover that unless... An- Crunchbase An- might here and there. Um, Angelus but, would show their personal oftentimes, investments. oftentimes, even the website will have that information on it. So, uh, you know, you can see what what deals the the partner's been on. Signal will have that to some extent. PitchBook will probably be the best because it'll actually show you who's on the board of those different companies. So yeah, I mean, step one, find the VCs that are actually relevant uh, to you. And then the next step is you got to get your foot in the door with those VCs. Like, so like, I guess my next question is, has it changed in recent years? You know, I don't think it's changed all that much. Only that the, there are a ton of VCs today that didn't exist five years ago. Uh, there are more and more people flooding into the market. There are more, there's more money in the market. So that's changed. And then, like I said, like Signal NFX and a bunch of these other tools, they also didn't exist five years ago. So to a certain extent, there's a huge advantage being able to tap into uh, a lot of those tools. And frankly, there's also a lot more funds out there that you can approach. The number of fake VCs increased, because I would assume over the last five years, that's probably increased with the popularity of wanting to seem important to get exposure. So how do you define a fake VC? A fake VC is someone who might say they're an investor on LinkedIn and has never invested more than 5K into a startup. I mean, I would say someone shouldn't be putting an investor on their title on LinkedIn unless they are like, you know, they've got a fund of at least 100K minimum, preferably a minimum, a million or more. Yeah. to be like a true investor. Otherwise, you're just like, a, it's like it's more of a hobby. I mean, I would almost argue if you only have a fund that's 100K, it's more it's mostly a hobby. Well, yeah, but like you could be like a personal angel investor and do an angel investment of like 25K a year. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. You but know? that's different than having a fund, right? That's, that's just right. like that'd, that'd be my having 100,000 allocated towards seed stage investments or angel stage investments. Right, but yeah. I see, there's a, a ton of people that I see that are investors mm-hmm. as part of like a pseudo way to get clients for their business. Oh, yeah. And I think yeah. that's Those are fake VCs. I mean, there's a spectrum, right? Because on the one hand, you have people that, you know, maybe they put $5,000 into an equity crowdfunding deal and call themselves a VC, uh, all the way up to still, in my opinion, kind of a fake VC if it's somebody that represents that they have decision-making power or check writing ability at a venture fund, but they actually don't, Okay. right? So then- Like an like, associate? Like an associate, somebody, or sometimes they'll even be a quote unquote partner, um, but still not have check writing ability and they'll string entrepreneurs along. So sometimes those fundless sponsors can be super legit and they can do very big deals and they have a very dedicated uh, investor base behind them and, and very legit, right? Just as, just as legit as a, you know, a, a partner at a yeah, $300 million dedicated venture fund. Uh, the flip side is, though, that they can also be a little bit fly by night in that they can promise an entrepreneur, oh, yeah, like we're in for 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, whatever it might be. And then they're not able to pull it together and they kind of leave the startup high and dry, which, you know, unfortunately, I've seen happen a few times this past year. 
a few times. So like, how common is this? I don't think it's like super common okay. um, because I think most people are, you know, sensitive to the fact that they don't want to overpromise and under deliver generally. But it is something like you have to think about as an entrepreneur. If you're going to take money from a fundless sponsor, you have to have a high degree of conviction uh, and confidence that they're going to actually be able to raise the money from their network of investors. What are some examples of fundless sponsors that might exist here locally in Utah or nationally? Uh, so here in Utah, there's there's a fundless sponsor, David Jensen with Sandlot Ventures. Okay. Um, you know, he's done a bunch of deals this year. And um, there's also another group called Sandbox that I know well. Um, yeah. And then you've got Assure and uh, Landon. And uh, Landon at Assure does a bunch of uh, SPVs into startups. Uh, you would also. call a syndicate as a fundless sponsor. Yeah, of course. Okay. Got it. Good to know. So the last question here, before I get into just a bunch of specifics are, will this process change in the coming years? You've got these, this website that shows you what investments are done, who particular has done it, and or what boards they're on. And you're just going through the database and you're just saying, how do I find something similar? Yeah, I mean, I just think there's going to be more and more proliferation of tools, right? So Andreessen Horowitz just backed a company called stonks.com, which is pretty interesting, kind of a equity uh, raising platform um, that has a bunch of videos on it of entrepreneurs pitching and then accredited investors can, you know, quickly view a bunch and, and make investments. So, you know, you've got Republic, you've got WeFunder, you've got... Seed Invest. I mean, there's there's a long long list after that too. So I think there'll be more and more of those types of platforms popping up um, that will enable entrepreneurs to find VCs. And then another way to find VCs is to talk to entrepreneurs that have raised money. Okay. Uh, and the more successful that they they are having raised money in terms of like the the type of fund that's invested in them, uh, usually means that they probably met with a lot more funds than just that one, right? So mm -hmm. if Excel or Sequoia or, you know, or Founders Fund, one of these large, well-known, reputable funds invests in a company, that entrepreneur in all likelihood probably met with all of the rest that he didn't take money from. And they can be a valuable resource as well to making introductions and, and pointing you in the right direction of uh, what VCs would find your particular startup interesting and which you know might be wasting your time. Mm -hmm. I think that's a common one that, that's shared with a lot of people. Let me ask this question. Should I be focusing on my geographic area to find a VC first? So like, let's say we were raising for appointment tomorrow. We've got Kickstart locally. We've got Album. We've got, um, oh, they just did the Peterson deal on Pickle. Peterson Ventures. Peterson Ventures. What's the uh, one that just invested in Pickle? Let me grab their name real fast. You've got Pete Capital. Pete Capital. The, the, Pickle. Tamarack? You have Tamarack, which is a family office. Okay. And there's probably a bunch of other family offices. Like if I'm going to fundraise and if I'm from the state of Utah, should I approach there first? And the reason I'm asking is at a prior startup called Tiny Torch, mm -hmm. we were looking to raise and we met with True Ventures. And one of their questions was, is, well, why aren't you first raising or getting a lead from your local state? Like, how do we know we can trust you as a foreigner? And they, I felt like they were looking for that signal of a local VC that was in, interested first before before they wanted a, a bite of the apple? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. You know, most early stage funds don't travel geographically as much as later stage funds do. So, you know, in that case, like there is a feeling of like, hey, it would be nice to, if I'm going to invest outside of the state to have somebody in the state that I know and trust that, that's coming in alongside me, that's kind of capturing some of that insider knowledge uh, within the state. Look, I think you should absolutely pitch to funds in the state where you are that are geographically close. The, in all likelihood, you probably have better networks, better relationships that can get you in front of them and it can't hurt the flip side is you want to be a little bit careful as an entrepreneur that you don't only take money from uh, funds that are geographically close because it could be that there's a better partner based on your business type somewhere else you know mm -hmm. outside of your geographic area and it may also be that um, that the local funds try to take advantage of you by being local and you end up with a slightly lower valuation than you could get if you had gone and but you once know, you get a entertained term, people from the coasts. But once you get a term sheet, as long as there's no auto, no shop clause, you're probably fine to keep looking, right? And then at that point, yeah, to an extent. the market might balance out. I think the biggest question right in my mind is, you know, how much time should someone spend pushing for funding if you can't get back and, you know, buy in from the local community? You know, should I hop on a plane and say, hey, like, be like Garrett G. Like, Garrett G literally, when he was raising for a scan, took 47 flights to Silicon Valley before he got Ariel Polar 
to lead his round and and run with it. And so in that case, he was lucky by kind of feel like, at least in my case, you know, maybe that was their excuse, but I felt like not having a local fund participating at all, even if they weren't leading, was a big stumbling block. Yeah, I don't know. It, it really, it, it can be a stumbling block because it's, it's, it's a red flag, right? It's like, well, if you have such a great company, then how come Kickstart or Album or, you know, they're whatever the fund is, how in. come they're not fighting to get in, right? Okay. But, you know, the flip side is like, look at Omniture back in the day, right? Josh went to like all the local VCs. They all turned him down, went to Silicon Valley and uh, ended up raising money from Hummer Winblad. And their comment was, if he had been here in the Valley, in, in Silicon Valley, we would have never been able to get into this deal because like, it's a really interesting, compelling deal. A lot of other people would have, you know, got it before us. Oh, so with Josh James and John Pistana years ago, there wasn't a market here in Utah. For yeah, VCs. but there were still venture funds. Much less than today, but even still, there's oh, not for that sure. many compared to Silicon Valley. But there were a lot less in Silicon Valley like, as well. We're still sub 10 venture funds that are significant in Salt Lake City. Yeah, but on a population like That's, level, it's actually a lot. Okay. Like what other, what other, you know, market or ecosystem of what are we at like half a million people or something like that it has as many venture shops as we do yeah I'm, I'm not sure i mean look even look at austin right everybody mm -hmm. talks about how great austin is we have more venture funds and more venture dollars being but, like but in yeah. funds here okay. in utah than austin does okay so i i don't know i don't buy that i think i think actually utah had a lot of venture money okay yeah, on a relative basis uh what are your thoughts on angel list is it like is it valuable now is it not valuable I think AngelList can be valuable. Uh, it's a little more geared towards like angel investors and seed stage investments versus like a like Series A. Okay, quick so tangent on that. Depends on what you're what you're raising for. To raise for VC, does having an angel help or hurt if you're looking? Depends on the angel. Generally speaking, general. Just having like some random angel. Yeah, not like not like Aerial Polar would be. Doesn't really matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. I don't think so. Doesn't help. Doesn't hurt. No. Okay, back if, to if they're a known entity that has a negative kind of like reputation, it probably hurts. And if they have a really good reputation, it probably helps a ton. Okay. So, you know, it can cut both ways. All right. Should I try to start there and just say, hey, who on the Forbes Midas list? And should I go top down? Um, sure. I mean, it's a list of VCs, so sure. But it's not always correlated with who's the best investor. Okay. And it's also not necessarily correlated with who's the best investor for you. Okay. What about a Twitter list? A Twitter list might be a good example. Is that a good place to go if someone's active on Twitter? I mean, I don't know if the, how Yeah, VCs love is. Twitter. So why do, they, why do they love Twitter so much? They like to post things that make them sound smart. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not as time intensive as other things like blogging. Okay. What are your thoughts on using a professional fundraiser as a source of finding investors and VCs? Okay. So they're a broker dealer. A broker dealer. Yeah. They can be helpful in a lot of cases, right? We have friends that have done it and helped a lot of companies raise money. Is that a good avenue to do it? Or should you wait till, hey, I've raised half my fund, now go to them and get them to close, help close the second half? I feel like if you're coming at this and you're brand new and you don't have a lot of relationships already, that they can be really helpful in terms of like opening the door to a lot of different groups. I think there are cheaper ways to do it personally, right? So like we mentioned earlier, like going to other entrepreneurs that have raised, mm -hmm. um, building relationships with them and having them make those those intros. But, you know, sometimes it can be really helpful just to bring on somebody that's, that's paid and full-time focus on helping you fundraise. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. From the entrepreneur perspective, it does signal a little bit negatively uh, so when I meet with somebody who's a professional fundraiser and it's obvious that they're just there to like help the company raise, I'm always a little like more hesitant. Cause it's like, okay. well, why can't you just do this yourself? Like, is it because your company's not that interesting? Is it because you as an entrepreneur aren't that compelling? Like you're not able to, to raise money, right? Like those are things that like make me as an investor, like pause, but not necessarily, oh, it's not a deal killer. That said, like, look, as an entrepreneur, and this is important, as an entrepreneur, if you're gonna build something big, one of the skills you need to have or you need to develop over time is the ability to fundraise. Because in today's day and age, like so much of success is driven by your ability to fundraise and then take that money and put it to work efficiently for growth. And that's how you compete in large part, right? You think about Uber, Uber, 
in large part one because they could out fundraise everybody else and so that is like a really valuable trait and so as a vc like that's something i care about like can this entrepreneur raise money because the last thing i want to do is put money into a company and then the entrepreneur can't raise any more money and the company burns through all the cash i gave them and then files bankruptcy right like there's a no bueno. Did you cry? Has that happened to you before? I mean, to a certain extent, like every every company that's failed fails because it runs out of money. Okay. Right? So, yes. Okay. <laughs> Is there a thing like a VC super connector? Like, are there people who just somehow that aren't VCs that tend to gravitate, have trust of, of a VC? Like, what would that person look like? Yeah, no, there's definitely those kinds of people. Um, so you see them in a lot of services industries. Okay. So lawyers, accountants sometimes will be like that, especially if they're really good at networking. You've got people that work at like accelerators uh, and angel groups that sometimes fit that role. Okay. Uh, sometimes just mm -hmm. angels themselves, right? They're, you know, they're not a VC, but they are actively investing and they kind of know everybody. So if I'm trying to fundraise, would it make sense to, to, instead of finding maybe a local Utah attorney, you say, hey, I mean, and, and maybe a local Utah attorney could help, but it's say, hey, let's go to Wilson Cincini or one of these Fenwick and West and one of these top Silicon Valley brands build a relationship with a VC as your in-house or not in-house, but as your counsel, does, is that, would that be, is that probable or not probable? Yeah. I mean, I think back in the day, it used to be that attorneys drove a ton of deal flow back to VCs. I don't think that's the case as much anymore, honestly. I think they can be helpful, but I would think less about like, oh, I need to have Cooley or I need to have Wilson Cincini or I need to have Gunderson because they can connect me to all these VC funds and think more about, hey, is there a partner at any law firm that's got a lot of connections that's a believer in what I'm doing that can open some doors for me? How would them? you find a, an attorney or an accountant that does that? Would you just have to go to the local like ACG Utah or others and just stay plugged in? Uh, you could do that. You could also just look at SEC. You could filings? reach out to entrepreneurs and say, "Hey, who did you use and who did you consider for your counsel?" Okay. Uh, you can talk to venture funds. Ask the same thing. Like, who who yep. in the market do you trust as an attorney when you, when it's either representing you or representing the company? Hey, Peter, who's an attorney in the market that you trust? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna give a shout out to my good friend James Platt over at Kunzler. Okay. Here locally. Okay. So he's, you know, in full full transparency, he's one of my former students, but he, he's awesome. Okay. Sounds good. So you talked about boot camp. Like, are things like New Chip, Techstars, Y Combinator, other like accelerators, would that be a good way to get VC funding to say, hey, I'm going to approach these groups first. I'm going to get the program and then leverage their network. Yeah. So my, my feeling on accelerators is that they are like MBA programs. Okay. You go to an accelerator for three things. You go for the brand, you go for the network, and you go because maybe you learn something slash they help you with your business. Different school, like state schools have MBA programs. Why do they have an MBA program if they don't have the best brand in the world? Mm -hmm. Well, because they may be specialized in helping their students with one thing or another right? They may provide a local network that's valuable. They may, they may have a great education. Those same things still matter if you're working with a, um, a startup accelerator that's not super well-known, like a Y Combinator or Techstars. No, the flip side is you go to Harvard, you go to Harvard because the network of the network and, and the because it's Harvard the brand, right? Mm -hmm. And then maybe you learn something cool, right? Mm -hmm. While you're there. Um, and I think that's the, the same thing why you would go to a Y Combinator or Techstars. Okay. Right. It's a it's an amazing network. It's a great brand. Okay. Right. And you know, maybe they help you a little bit. Okay. Um, but that network, uh, like I know a bunch of people who have gone through Y Combinator and the network's really powerful. Like they mm -hmm. really step up and help. They make introductions, they give feedback and guidance. Like would and Al those things can help you raise. Would for Alet sure. be where they're at today if they hadn't gone through Techstars? I'm not close enough to Alet to know one way or the other. Okay. On the flip side, uh, Lucichart applied to an accelerator locally, didn't get it. Now they're a multi billion dollar company, so So clearly they didn't need it. Clearly. Um, hey, but look, how many people never go to college and are billionaires? Okay, true. Right. What about syndicates? So like you, we talked about like fundless funds. Yeah. Jason Calcanis is one of my, I don't, I don't want to call him Your a idols. hero, an idol, someone who I feel like who's like a, a distant mentor because I've never personally met, to, met him. Yeah. But he talks a lot about like he's got his syndicate. I'm wondering, do you know what? Maybe that's a, a better way to raise funding or to, to attract a signal. 
Because a lot about raising f- funding is just signal. Is signaling. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of FOMO, right? In venture. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, all about FOMO. wow, if you're in there, wow, that must be a really good deal. I got to get in. I feel like my biggest, the hardest part about me for fundraising is yeah. creating FOMO. It's like the Theranos argument, right? Where's mm-hmm. that line? Because every entrepreneur, to a certain extent, like they're pushing the boundaries of, of reality just by being an entrepreneur generally, right? So they, mm-hmm. they have this vision that they're they're trying to communicate. But there is a definite line where like you are just straight being dishonest versus selling a vision. Mm -hmm. And I think good entrepreneurs are able to sell the vision without crossing that line of being dishonest. It's it's super tricky. It's super tricky. It is super tricky. And And look, like I'm on the one side because I'm just like, I don't want to say anything that I don't think I could could do. And I think, I don't know. Ultimately, it always comes back to bite them. If you lie and you can't deliver, Mm-hmm. You can't raise your next fund. You can't raise your next round. But then how many, toast. but most of these VC podcasts I listen to, they say what startups actually ever hit their, their numbers. Oh, we think we can be here. I mean, it's a pretty low percentage, but the, the reality is venture is a power law game mm-hmm. where there's a handful that do hit their numbers. And those are the ones that drive the returns. Mm-hmm. And let's think about it this way. Would you want to invest in a company that doesn't shoot for the moon? No, probably not in venture, right? Like in venture, you're all about like, hey, I got to get into the next huge big thing because that's going to drive all the returns. And so if a company pitches me and they're not even like trying to be the next big thing, then it's like, great. Like you don't even think you're going to get there. Why am I going to believe? Yeah, I'm out. Right. Okay. Does attending a local local networking events help like Silicon Slopes? I think, slopes, so. I think they can be helpful. Like that. Yeah. Should you like one thing that... um. Uh, Seth Godin has always talked about is building the relationships you want two years before it's going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. So he says, if you want to be a real estate agent, just to take a tangent, yep. he says, join the PTA two years before that way you're not selling anything. You can b- build authentic relationships. Yep. And then when you're ready, so like, I mean, I think for me, if I was wanting to fundraise and I was a college student or, or, or coming up, you know, was an unknown, being part of an organization, contributing, building my brand that way would be a powerful way. No, I totally agree. College students, like, they should be out networking and leveraging their student card to the hilt. But they're not. But they don't, they're usually. On, they're on Tinder way too much. If you say so, John. I, I know from firsthand experience. <laughs> My wife back here. We met on Bumble. All right. So are there any things that we missed, Peter, that would be helpful to talk about how to find a VC for your startup? So I think, like, VCs are pretty easy to find right? There's lots of lists of venture funds that are out there, right? There's lots of tools. I think the more challenging thing is finding the right angels for your investment, right? Okay. We should do that as a follow, as a follow podcast, how to find the right angel for your startup. And frankly, yeah, I mean, I think that's a little more tricky because there's, there are a lot of angels out there, but you don't always know who, who they are and the, you know, and how to get in front of them. And the other thing is, how to differentiate between the angels that are going to be good investors for your startup and the ones that are going to be like a disaster and you should stay away from because they're the the spread between like very high quality and stay away right is so vast with angels in comparison to venture funds Mm -hmm. like if you've raised money and you're an institutional venture fund, like, you know, you may fall somewhere on a spectrum, but it's going to be a much tighter spectrum than in the angel land. So I think honestly, though, that the answer is still the same, which is leverage the race, the relationships you have work with entrepreneurs, other entrepreneurs that have been successful raising, find out who they raise money from and get their recommendations and then get Build them to make intros. Yep. All the things that we think about, we want in life, most of them take longer to obtain than we think and so we just have to be slow and steady and and make those commitments hey my goal is i want to start my own company i want to be venture backed um get i think the right those experience. some things people just drag their feet on i think people are afraid. they just got to stand up and do it because they are afraid right gary g had no connections and went in one of the things i like about the, the so talking about finding people to help yeah. uh, gary g was a student of mine while i taught at a local university yeah and literally I'm like, this. he needs to make it. So I met with him and said, hey, I'm going to introduce you to all of the angel investors in Utah. Yep. Some of them might offer you money. Don't take it. Use it for practice. I mean, if you get a good deal, you get a good deal. Sure, but sure, my sure, guess sure. is once you get that experience, then immediately go to Silicon Valley. I didn't have connections at, the, at that time, but he did 40 intros in Silicon in Utah 
I think that really prepped him and he learned how to answer the tough questions. That's what I'm assuming. Yep. Garrett might can, you know, say you're wrong, but like I introduced him to like David Bradford, to a lot of people who had taken funding. Yep. And then he went and then raised a two, I think it was a $10 million round. Yep. First time as a, in college. It's pretty good. And he had no revenue, but he had a ton of downloads. Yeah. I mean, he had a product that was taking off. That mm-hmm. was interesting. Yeah. I think that's all I have for this podcast. Join us next time. We'll talk about this one. We talk about how to find a VC. The next one, we're going to talk about how to get their attention, how to land it, how to land it. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks guys for watching. Make sure you like subscribe. If you want to get in touch with Peter, we'll have his links in the bottom of this episode. All right. Thanks guys. Thanks. Boom. <laughs>